Okay, great. So welcome to um, Ian's third talk on IRS. And uh, today he's talking on unimodular random manifolds. Uh, all yours, Ian. Great. Well, thanks. Thanks again. Um, so, yeah, so today, uh, you know, we're talking about unimodular random uh, manifolds. Um, and, um, you know, I guess, I guess you've, so if you've been attending um, Miklos's mini course, then you saw him talk about unimodular random graphs. And, um, and these are the, uh, sort of the continuous analog. Okay. So, yeah, and I guess I should say, um, you know, unless I spe specify otherwise, which I might at some point. Um, so everything today is, um, uh, is from this paper that I wrote with Miklos uh, in, I guess it was, it came out in 16. Um, Okay, so all right. So what's the what's the setup? Um, so when unimodular random graphs were introduced, um, so what, a unimodular modular random graph was um, uh, you know the random element associated to a certain probability measure on the space of rooted graphs. And so here we need um, you know a continuous version of the space of rooted graphs, which is going to be a space of uh, pointed manifolds, uh, you know, rooted or pointed manifolds. So let's let uh, MD be all connected, um, complete, pointed Ramanian D manifolds. Um, so often I'll write them as M comma P. So pointed here just means like equipped with a base point. Um, so rooted if you want. Um, and then, so we consider them up to pointed isometry. So a pointed isometry is an isometry between the two manifolds that takes base point to base point. Okay, and then we need to, um, we need to equip this MD with some topology and the correct, uh, topology for our purposes is um, the smooth topology that we sort of talked about on in my first lecture a bit. We talked about a framed version of it in the first lecture, and this is just going to be a pointed version. So, um, but I'll write the definition once more. Um, so here a sequence like MIPI goes to M comma P. If um, there exists RI going to infinity, and uh, embeddings uh, phi i from the ri ball in m um, around the base point to mi such that uh, so the base points go to the base points so phi i of p is equal to pi and if uh, g i g are the Romanian metrics on the on the manifold on the manifolds then um, this phi i pulls back the Romanian metric on gi to something that converges smoothly to the Romanian metric on on um, on uh, m okay and you know if you if you recall from I think I said these words before, but um, the point is somehow that this condition that the Ramanian metrics pull back to things that smoothly converge to, to G, um, this is essentially saying that the, the phi i's for large i are very close to isometries, okay? And it's sort of stronger than just saying that they're one plus epsilon by Lipschitz with epsilon close to, to one or close to zero. Um, you know, it's it's something that takes into account all the derivatives of the metrics too, and so the the metrics themselves are are close, and the derivatives are close close on this huge ball around the base point. Okay. 
Um, and this is this is sort of the natural analog of of the of the topology on the space of rooted graphs that you might have um, uh, heard about earlier. It's just that um, you know the space of Ramanian manifolds has a little bit more flexibility in, uh, to it. So you're not it doesn't make sense to just sort of require that the the R ball in in um, in M is is like isometric to the R ball in MI for large I. Um, you want to allow the metric to change a little bit. Okay, so this is um. I mean, you might look at this and you think, oh my God, this is an awful space. Um, and yeah, well, I mean, it is an awful space. Uh, <laughs> but um, you know, at least it, you know it's not so awful. So uh, so it turns out that uh, MD is Polish i.e. has the topology of a complete separable metric space. Okay, and this is this is important because we're going to do measure theory on this space later and uh, you know Polish spaces are the spaces on which we want to do measure theory. Um, so yeah, so, so for this result, um, so Candel and uh, Alvarez Lopez and uh, Braulijo, um, so they they uh, so they, they sort of proved this um, at the same time that we were proving it, <laughs> uh, but. Um, so you know, and they have sort of a similar proof that that was that was independent of ours. Um, but you know, there's so we took forever to sort of finish the other parts of our paper. So uh, I mean, their, their proof came out like was available far before ours. So we should just attribute them for um, uh, the result to them. Um, so uh, um, yeah, but you know, you can also see our paper for like a um, well, for what I think is a slightly simpler proof even. But um, uh, but yeah, that's their theorem. Hmm. So, so okay. So let so we're going to consider a certain type of measure on um on uh so in these unimodular measures on on MD. And so in order to motivate the or in order to introduce the definition, I need an auxiliary space, namely this M two D. So this is the space of all doubly pointed. Um, Manifold. So, um, so this is just the same m's as above, but now they have two point base points instead of one. And then the equivalence relation is um, doubly pointed isometry. So you have a, an isometry from one manifold to the other manifold that takes uh, you know the first base point to the first base point, the second base point to the second point base point. Mm -hmm. And then, and then here's the the definition. So, a. Well, I mean, I guess I should say sigma finite. All measures are sigma finite today, at least, um, if not probability measures. Um, so a Borel measure uh, mu on M D is called unimodular. Um, so if uh, so for all non-negative uh, Borel functions, f from m to d to r, um, we have the following equation. So what I want is that the integral over m d, so over all pointed manifolds um, of the integral over all Q and M of F of M P Q Dval M D mu is equal to, well, the exact same thing, except, um, so I can even just copy. I can try to copy again. Um, Uh, no. Okay, so what's the what's the point? So um, 
So I want that integral to be the same integral, except I just switch P and Q in the integrand. Okay. So the deal is that, um, um, yeah, so, so, right. So, you know, in, in one of the integrals, the, the, the second thing, the second input to F is, is coming from the, uh, from the outer integral and then the other integral that's coming from the inner integral. Um, okay. So this, uh, this equality here is called the, the mass transport principle. Um, Um, which I guess I, I assume Miklos talked about at some point during his talk. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Good. So, um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> having, having, having all the, the rest of the talks be in the middle of the night for, <laughs> for me makes it kind of difficult. <laughs> so I, I apologize. Um, but, uh, so, Right, so this is the mass transport principle, and you know, essentially, what it what it really does. I mean, there are very various ways to kind of um, to motivate this, but what it really does is it indicates a compatibility um, you know of uh, mu and the Ramanian measures of different m's. Um, so that those are these vol m's. So, so the point is like whenever you have a Romanian manifold, there's a natural notion of volume on it, um, and uh, and yeah, and, th and what this this um, this definition is doing is just saying that these notions of volume on the different on the different manifolds are compatible with the 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 mu. Okay, um, like intuitively, you want to say you want to think that um, that like the base points. Um, Maybe I should say like the base points of uh, a mu random uh, MP. So if I pick MP mu randomly, then you kind of want to think of them as uh, um, like the P's as distributed um, in M according to, uh, to vol M. And you know we'll actually uh, state a theorem later that makes this sort of intuition here precise. Um, and that's actually something that I, I don't know uh, that I think is is easier to see in this continuous setting than it is in the graph theory in the graph theory setting. So um, yeah, so we'll, we'll see that a bit later. Um, and then so let's also just say that the random element of uh, a you know unimodular probability measure on MD is a unimodular random manifold. And sometimes we'll call that a URM. Any questions? You were working with M2D and somewhere it became MD. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what happened there. Uh, could you explain? Uh, M2D? Yeah, well, M2D is um, is this space of doubly pointed manifolds. And um, yeah. And you need, yeah. so that the function that you're taking is on M2D. Um, ah, but I then, okay. yeah, so that, that allows you to plug in two inputs here. Um, but I think I think everything on the page is is correct. Uh, does that make, does that make sense? Got it. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's do some examples. Um, all right. Well, you'll see. So you'll see some examples that probably feel familiar from the IRS or the or the unimodular you know, random graph setting. So the first one sort of corresponds to finite graphs. So so let's suppose M is a finite volume Ramanian manifold, Ramanian, like everything is sort of d-dimensional today. Um, uh, 
and um, and then we can create a, a measure mu m uh, on MD. Um, and this is the the measure on MD that you get by pushing forward um, just the measure vol. Mm. under the map. Um, so there's a natural map from MD to, or sorry, from, from like M to MD uh, that just takes a point P and M to the pointed manifold MP. Okay, so you're looking at all the different base points for M and then, um, you know, they give you different uh, MPs. Okay, and then you know you, mu m is this push forward, um, and then all right. So where does the uh, the mass transport principle come from? But well, I mean the point is just that both sides of the of the mass transport principle are equal to you know just the integral over m cross m of f of m p q. Um, just with the with the product um, and the product Romanian measure on m cross m, and you know this is just by like Fubini. Um, so, and so in particular, the two sides of the mass transport principle are the same. Um, and so the conclusion here is that m, you know, equipped with a random base point. is a uh, URM. Okay. So here mu, mu M, um, yeah, mu M I'm not taking to be a probability measure. So I'm just pushing forward this, this finite measure, um, you know, but you can extract a probability measure, measure from it by dividing out by the total measure. Um, and then, you know, that gives you this, uh, uh, and then a random element of that is a is a unimodular random manifold. Hmm. Okay, and then you know you can do something a little bit more general than this too. So, um, if uh, say you have a a regular cover, um, of um, you know, a finite volume manifold M, then, you know, I can do almost the same thing, but I can, I can take the, the push forward of, um, of vol M under the map um, M goes to MD, uh, and now P here, P and M goes to um, so not MP, but like N comma P tilde, where P tilde is some arbitrary point in pi inverse of P. Um, and then this, the push forward of the volume on M under this map is unimodular. Um, and so the 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 point is that um, you know this map here is well defined um, because of the equivalence relation in the definition of MD. Um, right, since uh, you know points in in MD are equivalence classes up to pointed isometry. Um, or equivalence classes with respect to um, pointed isometry, and so the point is that no matter what, um, no matter what p tilde I pick, that's uh, that projects to p. Um, you know, there's an element of the deck group which is an isometry of n that uh, takes one to the other, and so you actually get the same element of MD, and so this is actually a well-defined map.
Okay, and the, and the sort of picture that you should have in mind here is, um, I, mean, I think I drew this kind of picture when I was talking about IRS is it's really the same thing. Um, you know, so if I have, here's an example of a regular cover. Um, so this is just a cyclic, you know, a Z cover um, that I get from unwrapping this uh, sort of the circle direction of the manifold M. Okay, and then what's a, what is the, the URM that I'm describing? Well, it's like the, so the unimodular random manifold that I'm describing is like N equipped from a base point chosen from this fundamental domain. Um, so the URM is N equipped from, or equipped with a random base point chosen from some fundamental domain. Does that make sense? This is sort of a repeat of, uh, of the of stuff from the IRS lecture in some sense, just like presented geometrically. All right, so what are, what are some other examples? Um, so let's suppose that, uh, so this is like the analog of the transitive, gra of transitive graphs. So let's suppose that X is a, um, Ramanian D manifold such that uh, the isometry group of X acts transitively. Um, then any base point um, P and X, you know, gives the same uh, element, which I'll just call sort of like X and MD. Okay, so remember, uh, elements of MD are really pointed manifolds, but they're up to pointed isometry. So if the tr isometry group of X acts transitively, then, then any base point gives you the same element um, of MD, and I can just call that X instead of X comma P. And then the, the proposition is that, well, so the atomic measure Um, you know, one X, so just on this, the atomic measure on this point um, is unimodular if and only if G equals, you know, the isometry group of X um, is a unimodular Lie group. Okay. Um, so, I mean, you know, recall, I guess I said this last time, but, uh, G is unimodular if, um, well, let me say it a little bit differently than last time. Um, if the unique, you know, up to scale, um, left invariant measure on G. So you can look, so there's a unique, um, left invariant or left translation invariant um, measure on G. And there's also a unique right translation invariant measure on G. And you can ask whether the left invariant measure is the right for invariant measure. Um, okay, so that, you know if that's the unique, again, up to scale, um, right invariant measure. Um, Yeah, and you know, I, I don't know. Um, well, I guess you know, this is maybe kind of believable because this kind of unimodularity condition, like we're saying, okay, a left something is is equal to a right something. Um, that's the same kind of condition uh, as you have in the empty in the mass transport principle, right? You have this sort of left inner. <laughs> I mean, there's an integral on the left side of the equation and an integral on the right side of the equation. You're asking if the two are, two are the same. Um, but it's a little bit more similar than that even. Like, a, like you, can, you can really um, regard the two sides of the mass transport principle as the, as the equality of two 
um, sort of, of a left measure and a right measure in the same way that you can when G is unmodular. Um, All right, so so we'll we'll consider the um, um, the set of probability measures. So this is P of M D. Oh, sorry, I don't have my chat open, which maybe is um, ah, okay. Right. So one question. Um, my understanding is that the manifolds M aren't assumed to be compact. So there is some obvious dying at infinity assumption on the functions F. This was in the mass transport principle. Um, um, what was the point? Uh, no, I mean, I, the, the Fs I, can be, I guess, whatever non-negative Borel uh, measure, that, uh, Borel function that you want. Um, So, yeah, so let's see. So you have a, so we'll consider the set of probability measures. Um, on um, MD with the weak topology. And then, you know, you can check that unimodularity is a closed condition. Um, I mean, maybe this is not such a huge surprise since it's, you know, it's inequality. <laughs> Equalities usually end up being closed conditions, but, you know, there's something to check here. Um, so uh, any weak limit, um, of uh, unimodular um, probability measures is unimodular. I mean, okay, that's what it means to be closed. Um, uh, and so, you know, gives. So I guess I, I guess I'm saying this because um, if you want examples of unimodular probability measures, then you know you can just take weak limits of um, of uh, of ones that you already have. And in particular, um, you can define a, a version then of Benjamin Schramm convergence in this in this Ramanian setting. So, so just for future reference, let's suppose um, MI is a sequence of finite volume Ramanian D manifolds. Um, then you know we say that the sequence MI Benjamini Schramm converges um, if uh, the you know measures mu m uh, so mu MI so you remember though this mu MI is so these aren't probability measures these have like whatever total mass, um, you know, they have, these have total mass equal to the volume of MI. And so if I, but if I um, divide out by the volume of MI, then I get probability measures. Um, and the manifolds MI, Benjamin and Schramm converge if the measures, um, if these probability measures converge weakly. Okay. Mm. And then, all right. So, I mean, uh, probably at this conference, most people are are familiar with Benjamin Schramm convergence, at least in the in the graph theoretic setting. Um, but uh, let me just okay. Let me just put like one intuitive example up so that we can think, so we can train our brains to think about Benjamin Schramm convergence of manifolds. Um, so here's a, I don't know, maybe this is my favorite way to 
to illustrate this in the manifold setting. So let's take the following manifold, the following surface as MI. So I want to take um, a surface that looks like that looks like the following. So in the middle, I have like I different um, uh, different sort of blocks, which are each like a, a torus with two holes. Okay, so this is like I. I don't know. Let's make them like unit volume. Um, uh, you know, blocks, all isometric. So I don't like really care what, what is going on in each of the blocks. I just want them, them to be all the same and they're all glued together. Um, and then, so off the ends, I want to have like a big sphere. Um, okay. Maybe there's another one over on the other end too. Uh, all right, so this is a uh, huge round sphere um, with volume I, say. And then what you're doing is you're sort of patching these together here uh, somehow. Um, Okay, and then, you know, this is also another huge round sphere of volume I over here. Okay, so so here's an exercise for us all to complete together. Um, uh, what does this converge to? Uh, what's the Benjamini Schramm limit of this? Um, okay, so, so the way that I'm thinking about this, um, you should think of the of the parts where I'm patching the pieces together as kind of irrelevant for Benjamin Schramm convergence because I'm imagining that all happening in sort of a small volume set. Um, so in that case, like what's the uh, yeah what's the Benjamin Schramm limit? Um, anybody want to chime in or, or I mean or we can just I can tell you in a minute. <laughs> Okay. Well, all right. Two so, planes and, and, a, and a chain of uh, tori. Um, that's, yeah. Okay, right. So one plane and a chain of tori. Totally. Okay. And then, you know, we're thinking about a measure. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to want to. Two thirds and one. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Right. So what, I'm, what am I doing? I'm taking then like, uh, you know, two thirds times um, one. So the atomic measure on R2. Okay. Um, and then plus one third times this other, um, you know, like this thing that I drew earlier where you have uh, this sort of infinite chain of genus and then you're picking um, the base point randomly from like one of these blocks. Okay, and like what I'm emphasizing here is that uh, uh, you know, there's this little bit of flexibility in the metrics that's inherent in the smooth topology, right? And so the, the point is that like, as you take a sphere around a, a, a bigger and bigger rounder, then, you know, it becomes flatter and flatter. Um, and so uh, so in the limit, you actually get a flat plane. Um, like you, you lose the spherical, the sphericality in the, in the limit. Um, okay, any questions about, about that? All right, so yeah, so maybe for another example, um, so these, uh, so it turns out that that um, these unimodular random manifolds correspond to IRSs in a certain setting. So, so let's suppose that uh, G equals I sum of um, X and, um, uh, and that this acts transitively on um, a D manifold X um, and X is simply connected. Uh, 
um, then so the the map um, so it, you know we talked about this map last time where if you have a or maybe two times ago you know if you have a a discrete torsion free uh, subgroup of G Um, then from that you get, well, I think we originally talked about framed manifolds, but you can actually, you know, you can just um, take a point, uh, make it a pointed manifold if you want. Um, so just by taking, you know, the, uh, the projection of uh, some fixed base point in, um, uh, in X, so uh, that's the px. Mm. And so if we look at this map that takes a subgroup to this pointed manifold, um, then this uh, pushes forward any you know, g-invariant measure on, um, on sub g df. Uh, to a unimodular measure on um, on MD. Um, and in fact, uh, it, this induces like a, a, a weak homo homeomorphism between um, so the space of, of discrete uh, torsion free IRSs of G and the space of um, unimodular uh, random X manifolds. Um, so MP up to pointed ice, or well, yeah, in the space of unimodular random X manifolds. Okay, so here, uh, just recall that you know an X manifold. This this is just a a Ramanian manifold of X. Um, okay. Right. So so discrete torsion free IRSs of this. Um, uh, this isometry group uh, exactly correspond to unimodular random X manifolds. Um, okay, well, you know, I guess maybe as you've guessed, like a unimodular random X manifold is just, you know, it's a it's a unimodular random manifold that's almost surely of the form X mod gamma. Any questions about that? I mean, I guess I you might want to. Yeah, what's up? Uh, yeah, not about this example in particular, but um, I was just trying to um, compare a unimodular random graph and an unimodular random manifold. So um, so there, in the graph setup, we had, I mean, we, we, we took some measure, I mean, uh, uh, on the space of all rooted graphs, which had this upper bound on the degree. And then we lifted it to, um, the uh, space of all such graphs which have a, a marked edge, right? And then uh, we said that the lift is, uh, you say that this graph is going to be unimodular if it's invariant under this uh, flipping operation, right? And uh, that was probably equivalent to the uh, uh, the mass transport principle, right? Holding for the measure. So I was thinking if there's a similar picture here because uh, we have the integral equation. Yeah, no, there is. Um, I guess I, right, I guess I wasn't going to mention, yeah, I guess for some reason I decided not to mention that, but like, the, yeah, the, there is. And I think the closest thing, um, I think the closest thing is to that is like, what you can do is you can take a unimodular random manifold and then you can lift that. Um, and then the, this, the analog of lifting it to the space of, um, uh, of, uh, of graphs with distinguished edges um, is like 
lifting it to um, you know some sort of tangent space to to the space of pointed manifolds. So it's like you know instead of having a base point, um, uh, now I have like a base vector. So I have a point and also a vector. And then you know one way you can phrase you know modularity is saying that this sort of lift of the original um, uh, the original measure on MD um, to the space of like vectored manifolds um, is invariant under the geodesic flow. Um, yeah, I think that's the, I think that's the 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 right way to to say something that's that's close to what you're thinking about. Um, Okay. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And another thing was that uh, probably this is a more creditable question, but so we were discussing in the graph setup that uh, when is the uh, Benjamin Schramm limit of some uh, uh, graphs going to be unimodular? So here we have a sequence of I mean finite volume manifold. So when can we decide if the limit is going to be unimodular? Um. Well, you mean you you were trying to take limits of things that were in finite volume or? No, we had finite graphs, uh -huh. and and uh, we were uh, we were taking the limit Benjamin Schramm limit, and uh -huh. we're trying to decide when that's going to be unimodular. So um, here we have the same thing really, same. It's not the same thing, similar picture really. So I was wondering, such a question uh, is plausible to ask. Can you... Well, I mean, you know, if you're taking. Uh... I guess what kind of conditions were you talking about in the graph theory setting? Like, you know, if you're taking a, a sequence of of like bounded degree graphs that are or that are um, that are all finite, then like the BS limit will be unimodular, right? Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. So I mean, in, in the same way here, like if you take it like any sequence of uh, of finite volume D manifolds. Um, Oh wait, are you asking like when does it have a convergent subsequence? Or I mean, whenever whenever you have a BS limit, it's going to be unimodular. Um, right, uh, but there's also the other way around, right? I mean, uh, so you'll have uni unimodular random manifolds, but are they going to be? Um, uh, oh yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. So that that's a right. That's a, that's a great question, and that's that's just as open in this setting as it is in the graph theory setting. So okay. yeah, I mean, you call this like sophicity of unimodular random manifolds or something. Um, so yeah, whether you can realize them as weak limits of uh, of like finite volume, uh, uh, whether you can realize them as Benjamin Schramm limits of uh, sequences of finite volume manifolds. Um, yeah, and you know we don't even know. Yeah, I mean it's 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 really open. It's like unless you can can obviously write it like that, then then we probably don't know. <laughs> Um, <laughs> okay. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Um, uh, another quick question. Ian. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is there a discretized version? I mean, can one go back? I mean, so the, the uniform um, random manifold is a is a translation in the Riemannian manifold context of what uh, of 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 the, the the graph concept. I mean, can you discretize a manifold appropriately? Yeah, that's a great. And, that's a great question. Get back. Um, I that's a that's a great question. I don't know. Um, I don't think that there's a um that there's a good way to do that. Uh, in a way that'll completely satisfy you. Um. Like in some sense, the, in the paper that I'm going to talk about next time, we do do that. Okay. Um, okay. But it's you know, but we're sort of it's like we don't we don't completely do that, but we do enough of that that it allows us to pro prove our theorem. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> and, okay. Um, yeah, and I think it's I think it's a good it's a good sort of open question whether 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 you can. Um, um, yeah, I mean, essentially, what you want to do is you want to sort of take your manifold and then choose like a. Um, and then randomly assign like a, a net to it. Um, exactly, exactly, right. exactly, um, yeah. And yeah. you know, that's that's kind of what we do in this in this paper, um, but it's, it's I think it's pretty subtle to, to actually get it to work out exactly. Um, so yeah, it's a good question though. Okay. Mm. All right, so here's a final example. Um, 
So, and this is a, so this is how to get unimodular measures on MD from foliated spaces. Um, okay, so this is, uh, this we haven't seen in the, in the discrete setting. So let me just re remind you that a, a D-dimensional foliated space Um, so it's a space uh, X, that's the union of of um, D manifolds L called leaves. Um, where, so every point in, in X has a neighborhood of the form Um, well, the neighborhood picture sort of looks like this. So, um, so the neighborhoods of the form like B cross uh, Z, where um, where B and RN is some open and RD is is some open set. Okay, so the B is the uh, the horizontal here, um, and where each uh, B cross little z um, is an open subset of some leaf. Okay, um, all right. So each one of these little uh, B cross little z's here, um, that's an open subset of some leaf. And so the just you know the pictures that you should have in mind. The sort of canonical example um, is, you know, you take the torus, uh, so I'm going to view it as gluing up two sides of a square, and then, um, and then you can regard this as a foliated space where, um, um, where the leaves kind of look like this, um, so where leaves are the you know projections to the torus of um, of like lines of slope uh, alpha in RD, um, and so then each one of these leaves uh, are you know is a circle if alpha is rational and. Uh, a line otherwise. Um, okay, so you want to imagine like the leaves here, you know, you sort of follow along in the slope alpha direction, and then maybe that comes out down here, and then that comes out over here, and then that comes out over here, and the sort of picture goes on for a while. Um, and either it closes up at some point if alpha is rational or it doesn't. Mm. So So if I have a foliated space um, X, then it's Ramanian. If uh, each leaf um, comes with a Ramanian metric, and the metrics vary smoothly um, in the transverse direction. So, right, so I'm just thinking of, uh, you know, I have this foliated space and I have Ramanian metrics on all the leaves. Um, so, you know, an example of that would be you take the torus picture here and then you just put the, you know, the usual um, Lebesgue measure on each one of these, or you, you put the, just the arc length metric on each one of the, the leaves in, in, the, in the picture. Um, so then we say that a, a measure, um, mu on x is um, completely invariant if um, 
locally, so like in one of those, those charts that I gave you earlier, uh, it is the integral of the Ramanian measures on the leaves. against, um, you know, some measure on the transverse space. Okay, so you remember the picture was was this, so I have all these, um, these leaves, and then, you know, uh, so I just want to say that it's a you know, I have the Ramanian measure on each one of these, and then I'm integrating up those against some some z, and that's the local picture of this completely invariant measure. Okay, and maybe just as an example, um, just the the uh, if I look at the the torus like equipped with the the flat metrics met, metric, then um then it's it's Ramanian volume is a uh, you know locally the integral of um you know Lebesgue measure on the leaves against um Lebesgue measure in the transverse direction Okay, and so like the the natural volume on the torus is is a um, is an example of a completely invariant measure. All right, and so then the 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 proposition is the following: so if uh, mu is a let's say finite um, completely invariant measure on a Ramanian foliated space, um, so I can make a, a unimodular measure on MD from it. So namely, I take the the leaf map, which is it's a map from X to MD, where little x goes to um, LXX, where this is the leaf through X. Then this leaf, leaf map is is Borel and uh, pushes forward mu to a uh, unimodular measure on MD. Okay. Right, so from it, for from any completely environment measure on a Ramanian foliated space, you get a, a a unimodular measure on MD. Any questions about that? Yeah, could you tell us why why this should be unimodular? Mm. Well, I mean, yeah, I I think it's um. I mean, you have to prove that there's, I mean, you can, you can sort of state the mass transport principle for foliated spaces in some sense. Um, right. Um, you know, I mean, yeah, you can say it's sort of a, a, almost exactly the same version of mass transport principle for foliated spaces. And that turns out to be equivalent to this. I mean, I think it's it's like a little bit of a story to try to relate the two, uh, to relate the men's transport principle to this complete invariance principle. But it should be believable that they're the same, because if you think about it, you know, both of them really mean, I mean, like, like um, the, the complete invariance, that exactly means that like the, um, the, you know, the whole measure mu is composed of the Ramanian measures of the, of the, on the leaves, um, sort of integrated locally against some transverse thing, and so that's that's saying that the that the this mu is is compatible with the 
the Ramanian measures on the leaves, which is exactly the same thing that I was saying that the uh, that the mass oh, transport okay. principle says, right? So it's, it's giving you a compatibility between the the, the hmm. unimodular okay. measure yeah. and the um, Ramanian measures. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah, and in fact, you know, this is the right. This is in some sense the right way to think about unimodular um, measures on MD, because. Um, in some sense, uh, that example, this foliation example, is the only example. So, um, because so, all right. So you know, if, so what I can do is I can look at the maps um, M go to going to M D. Um, maybe I'll call it I, where I of I of p equals mp. Um, so I can, you know, I can make this map like for any Ramanian d-manifold. Um, um, so not just, you know, earlier we were talking about only finite volume manifolds, but now just pick any Ramanian d-manifold, and you can, you can make this map. And. Um, and then if you look at the images of these maps, well, they, they almost form the leaves of a foliation of MD. And, you know, the only problem is that um, if you look at I of M, well, you remember there's an equivalence relation on MD, so where uh, you know it's by pointed isometry, and so the image of a manifold doesn't actually necessarily look like the manifold. What it really looks like is is uh, the manifold sort of divided out by its isometry group. Okay. Um, and you know that that may not be a manifold. Um, I mean, you know, if the isometry group acts transitively, it's a point, right? So in some sense, um, like MD itself has this, I mean, you, you kind of want to think of it as having like a foliated structure, but like some, th some of the leaves are, are like crazily singular. Okay, and you know it can it can be worse than just like the isometry group acting transitively. You know, then the quotient is is quite nice. You know, it's a point, but you know the isometry group could act, uh, you know, in such a way that the quotient is is like you know it's not a manifold of any dimension. Um, it's something kind of uh, yucky. Um, right. Somehow the point is the mass transport is something like Fubini. Um. So yeah, when I mean, you're already in a Riemannian foliated, you have Fubini. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so so in this setting, um, right? So so right. So I guess the point is like, okay, you want to regard MD as a as a foliated space, but you can't quite. Um, and so what we prove is we prove, I guess, something we call this desingularization theorem. Um, and what that says is that there exists a, a Ramanian foliated space. Uh, maybe I'll call it PD, such that uh, every unimodular measure mu on uh, MD is the push forward of um, some completely invariant measure uh, so new on um, 
PD under the leaf map. Okay, so the leaf map was the same thing as above where you just take a point in, in PD to like the pair leaf containing that point comma point. All right, so uh, next. Yeah. And the leaves of uh, PD are precisely all MDs? Or what is um, yeah, right, the, the leaves of, um, of PD are, well, I mean, they're, they're they range through all the different uh, um, D manifolds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And you know, I mean, really, the 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 point, just very briefly, the idea is that um, you know you can sort of set PD just to just be equal to all pairs or all triples MPD, where D and M is. Uh, is some locally finite set, um, and uh, there does not exist a non-trivial isometry f from m to m sending d to d. So, um, right. So somehow the point was that uh, like m d wasn't foliated because um, the m's have isometry groups. And so that allows some of the leaves to be singular. Um, and so what you do is you sort of like plunk down uh, subsets on all the M's that obstruct the, the, the isometries. So you know, you're obstructing the symmetry so that the leaves desingularize. Okay, and then, and then the point is that if you have some mu on MD, then you're, you're sort of making new on this PD by sort of integrating um, uh, like Poisson processes on all the different M's against, uh, against mu. Um, but, you know, this is yeah, it's a pretty pretty technical proof too. I mean, because it's it takes some doing to to actually show that this thing that you're defining here is foliated. Um, yeah. Okay. And then you know, as as just a remark, I I would say that um, uh, so this theorem uh, shows how unimodularity really means, um, you know, base points are distributed um, according to the, you know, volumes um, of uh, different M, um, right? Because, you know, we said that that's a like that's that's sort of exactly what complete invariance of a of a measure on a foliated space means, and so and this desingularization theorem is essentially saying that um, that unimodular measures on M D uh, exactly correspond to um, uh, to complete invariant measures on um, to completely invariant measures on foliated spaces. Yeah, and I guess I should maybe I'll just mention verbally that um, um, Alvarez Lopez and Baralijo, uh, they they sort of in, independently prove a different kind of desingularization theorem for MD. Um, you know, using a slightly different technique. Um, uh, but you know that, yeah, I mean their 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 theorem doesn't have anything. There's nothing measure theoretic about their theorem. Um, and they sort of have different different aims. Um, so that they were trying to prove that any Ramanian manifold with bounded geometry can be embedded as a leaf in a compact Ramanian foliated space. So, but they 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 have a theorem that's that's kind of similar to this desingularization theorem. 
Any questions about that? Okay. So, so maybe in the last part of the talk, um, I want to talk about one feature of of unimodularity and maybe just briefly discuss a couple applications. Um, so, so this is the no core principle. Um, did Miklos never never use this term? Did he? No. Okay. Uh, no. No. He did. He did actually. What's that? No, at one point, yeah. Okay, well, all right. So I, I'll take it from so, that. Uh, then again. Yeah, he, he did mention something about the free groups. So, so that's, I think, the context in which he mentioned it. But it's not okay. Yeah. Well, that, that's fine. So uh, so what this says is that um, suppose that, that mu is a unimodular probability measure. on MD and uh, F from MD to zero one is a Borel function. Then for, so mu almost every um, MP, we have the following. So maybe I'll call this condition star or something. Um, so whenever you have that that the uh, that the volume of the set of um, of Q and M, where f of m Q equals one, is strictly between zero and infinity. So whenever you have this, the only way that can happen is that the volume of m is is finite. Okay. And this is, I don't know, I, I think the hard part about this, this, this no core principle is just coming up with a statement. Um, and so I, you know, I encourage you, you, you can, you can really just prove this as an exercise. I'm not going to do it now just to, because I think it's better that I talk about the applications. Um, but it's really like, you can, you can write this down um, in like two paragraphs, just straight from the definition of the mass transport principle. Okay. Um, so yeah. So if you want to want to get some intuition for mass transport principle, try to do that. Um, but you know, I think maybe what's more important is to sort of understand what the what the statement says. Um, so what you should imagine is that uh, f of m q equals one when uh, Q is in some sort of um, geometrically defined core of M. So, you know, like a picture would be, so imagine maybe I have some, some surface that's like, that kind of looks like this. I don't know. So I've got, maybe I have like these three ends and the genus goes out them or whatever, um, whatever. Um, so then, you know, you look at this picture and and there there does sort of seem to be some sort of core to this, right? Like, you know, you wanna say that this, this center, um, the center of it is kind of geometrically distinguished from other parts of it. Um, and so, what does the no core theorem say? It says that if you have a unimodular probability measure, so the only way that you can have some sort of core um, that has uh, like finite but non-zero volume is if the whole manifold has finite volume. Okay, so, so you only have a finite volume core if uh, and the whole manifold has finite volume. Okay. 
Okay, so in other words, like this picture that we're looking at here, this does not um, happen in a, in a URM. Okay, so like this, this, this manifold does not, um, does not occur in a URM. Does that make sense? Yeah. You can never have, for example, um, more than two ends for a unit random process. It, yeah, unless you have a yeah. So maybe like one one corollary of this. Um, uh, so I guess technically this was written down by Jean Jean Rambo and, and myself in seventeen. So I mean, but it's this particular thing is not very hard. Um, so you know, a, a URM um, almost surely has. Um, Either you know zero, one, two, or uh, a counter set of ends. Okay. Um, and so one thing that 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 allows you to do is um, uh, so you can also um, uh, use this to. Uh, to classify, you know, exactly which types of, um, which like topological types of surfaces uh, appear um, in a, uh, you know, a, a URM. Well, I guess I need to say URM with, uh, with bounded curvature. Um, Um, so this is sort of like following G's, um, but maybe I'll, um, yeah, maybe I'll skip that and talk about the, the sort of second application. Um, I think that'll be more interesting. So, um, yeah, so maybe just for the, for the last application here, um, you know, as a as a as a corollary of the of the no core theorem, you get that um, if S is a unimodular you know, random hyperbolic surface, um, with finitely generated um, fundamental group. Then almost surely S has um, has finite volume, or is just H two. Okay, um, and you, you know the. In other words, you could rephrase this as saying any discrete torsion-free finitely generated IRS of PSL two R is a lattice. Um, and you know the the proof of this is just that um, uh, you know hyperbolic surfaces not equal to H two um, with a finitely generated pi one and uh, infinite volume have. Uh, Sort of a finite volume convex core. Um, you know, C of S. And the sort of picture you should have in mind is something like um, uh, I have this surface with geodesic boundary, and then there's some flare, and then the convex core is the, the surface except for the flares. Right. Yeah, and um, you know, and so you could also sort of ask about um, uh, 
you, this is the situation for hyperbolic two manifolds, and you can also ask about you know what's going on for hyperbolic three manifolds. Um, and you know, there's a bit of a story here, um, but maybe I can just uh, state the the end theorem instead of telling you the story. Um, and so that says that um, right. So like, what about in three man in three dimensions? Well, it turns out that uh, so so this is again from um, that paper with Miklos. Um, so any uh, unimodular random hyperbolic three manifold with finitely generated fundamental group is um, Almost surely, either. Uh, okay, so you could have. So it could be finite volume. It could be um, just H three. And the only other option is um, uh, something called a so a doubly degenerate uh, hyperbolic three manifold. homeomorphic to a surface cross R. Mm. So, yeah, so, you know, I'm not going to, if you know what these, if you have some experience in three manifolds, then you know what these are, but um, just the picture that you should have in mind is, is, um, is it's a, it's a hyperbolic three manifold that's homeomorphic to just a surface cross R. Um, so I'll draw it like that maybe. And, right, and the doubly degenerate sort of, um, indicates that it's a uh, that geometrically it's um it's exhausted by you know copies of S that have bounded area. Um, Okay, and and you know, really the point is that the um, yeah, or well, whatever. I mean, the, you know, such things are well understood by by uh, three manifold geometers. Um, yeah, and so the point is that you know you you get this you get this sort of complete classic. Well, maybe I won't go so far as to say classification, but you get this description of um, what all the possible uh, you know, modular and hyperbolic three manifolds with finitely generated pi pi one r. Okay, so this is this is in other words describing like discrete torsion free, um, finitely generated uh, IRSs of of um, the isometry group of H three. Okay, so I guess I'll just stop there. Okay, uh, thanks, Ian. Thanks very much. Um, any questions? Yeah. Um, so, so Ian, uh, this one thing about this last statement that you've made here about um, uh, the, so the two-ended case. So that's in the in the three-manifold case. So. Um, Right. So, so what? What exactly? Um, so, you could put a measure on a family of doubly degenerate uh, hyperbolic manifolds. Is that correct? Yeah. So, um, so which means what? Presumably, say something like um, take the boundary of Tychmiller space cross boundary of Tychmiller space, and uh, I'm, can one? See, basically, if, if you have doubly degenerate manifolds, that's parametrized by two ending laminations, right? So some, I mean, there, there are all kinds of ergodicity theorems about the action of the mapping class group on, on this boundary, cross boundary. So um, can one say something like, which are the ergodic components here? Or? 
I mean, that's a, that's a good, that's a good question. I don't think, um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'm sure nobody has, has worked on that, uh, so far, like the, you know, in the, in the, in the seven author paper, um, we do construct a whole bunch of, um, of, uh, you know, unimodular measures that are supported on um, these doubly degenerate three manifolds, but they're, they're all, they're all created. Um, so we don't, we don't like try to parameterize them via ending invariance. Like we, what we do instead is, is just take like, um, you know, take, take mapping tori, uh, like, you know, construct a sequence of mapping tori and then just extract the weak limit of those measures. Uh -huh. wow. um, okay. And, uh, and, you know, that's a, that's a pretty robust construction because you can use all yeah. the, yeah. the model technology to understand what the limits look like. Um, yeah. But yeah, but we haven't, we haven't done anything trying to, to understand them from the end invariance. So, you know, I think that would be, that would be interesting. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, and any other questions? Yeah. I apologize if the last part was kind of fast. <laughs> no, it's, 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 yeah, it's very interesting. Thank you. Um, okay. So, so, Thanks, Ian, and uh, we look forward to the, the next talk on Thursday. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Yeah, pleasure. Mm -hmm.